Hello and welcome to Health Literacy Train the Trainer. I'm Nikki, an assistant professor and liaison librarian at the College of Nursing and the hospitals. The purpose of the presentation is to enhance your understanding of health literacy so you can pass that knowledge on to students and, if applicable, patients. What we're going to discuss today is what health literacy is, why it's important, some common issues and misconceptions, practical tips, and suggested further learning for yourself and for students and patients. So what is health literacy? When we discuss health literacy, most often the focus is on personal health literacy. So that's how much patients and consumers understand healthcare information, finding it, using it to make decisions about the healthcare for themselves and for families. There's also organizational health literacy, and that's how much organizations, hospitals, clinics, even um, higher education institutions and communities enable individuals to get that knowledge. So why is this important? Health literacy is one of the strongest predictors of health status, and this is more so than socioeconomic status, race, any kind of background information or comorbidities. People with lower health literacy have lower compliance or adherence. This is especially true with conditions such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Lower rate of correct prescription interpretation. Um, this Wolf article was really fascinating. He looked at specifically um, the information that's FDA approved that's given to patients, like the pamphlets and how well they can understand them. People with lower health literacy have a lower rate of patient satisfaction. Um, one way to keep this in mind would be uh, managing expectations. If you don't fully understand the procedure, how healthcare works, how medication works, then more likely to think like, oh, I'll just take this pill and that'll make everything better. Um, or this, they'll put me on morphine, that means I'll have zero pain. I'll get home and my life will be completely different now that I've had this surgery. And to a certain extent that might be true, but it's not going to be a complete reversal of whatever it is. So having those expectations managed right away, patients are going to be more satisfied. If somebody doesn't understand healthcare, they're more likely to be readmitted. They're less likely to be involved in shared decision-making. Um, somebody might think like, oh, you know, the patient, their family just really weren't engaged. And it might not be that they don't want to be engaged. It's just that they don't know what questions to ask and they really don't know how to be involved. Patients who do have higher health literacy have more trust in the healthcare system. They're going to talk to their doctors more. They're going to take more of an active role. Some common issues, this is from the patient side of things. So patients may assume the provider has all the information. Like, well, why do I need to have a list of medications I'm on? You, you know all this, right? Um, they might go to UIH um, instead of their normal doctor or advocate and go like, oh, you don't have all my information? Like, no, not all the hospitals talk to each other and share information. Uh, we actually can't. So having, having that knowledge and having patients understand what they need to know and that the doctor doesn't have all their information on file, doesn't have all the answers. It's also um, fairly common for side effects to be mistaken for allergies. People who are on uh, several medications, especially older adults, may not know why they're on certain medications or may not understand the timing of doses. Okay, you're supposed to take it every day. Do they know it's supposed to be taken roughly the same time every day? If it's supposed to be taken multiple times a day, do they know it's supposed to be taken with meals 
or maybe that it's supposed to be taken a certain amount of hours. I, that kind of thing is really important to make sure that it gets across to patients. And there's also making sure that patients and family members are on the same page. Let's take somebody with hypertension. Like you're going to tell them they need to be on a low salt diet. Are they the ones who does the, co the cooking and gets the groceries? Do they understand how to read a nutrition label? Like making sure that all the information is accurately conveyed. Um, I have some quotes here. And these are, again, things that I've heard, things that you may have heard, um, like morphine, like, oh, I get nauseous. Um, I get constipated. I get really tired. Those, that's not an allergy. That's, that's a, those are very common side effects. Um, the majority of people who are on those kind of um, higher end analgesics are going to have those reactions. People with diabetes, especially if it's a um, newer diagnosis, they might not know what the levels are. For like, okay, if you're under 100, like that means this. If you're over 100, that means this. There's also nutrient dense versus high calorie. Those are very different things. But the patient doesn't know that. Or having a family member who's a healthcare worker, like, oh, my sister's a nurse, she'll understand the doctor. Or my wife has a master's in public health. Like that person is very knowledgeable, but that doesn't mean they're going to understand a specialist, especially in a field such as um, oncology. Common misconceptions, these are more from the healthcare worker side of things. So many workers have had an encounter with a patient who had low health literacy, and they may have thought, okay, that's, that's the exception. That person was not well-educated. That person did not have English as a first language. So um, naturally, their health literacy is going to be a little lower. As long as I don't use jargon, I speak clearly, they're going to understand. And unfortunately, that's just not true. Um, there was a 2003 study, and I did check. They haven't redone this study since. Only about 12% of the American pop adult population has high health literacy. And while I'd like to think it's gotten better in the last 20 years, just thinking about how social media and the pandemic and all the misinformation that was spread and is still being spread about all that 12% actually sounds about right. But hey, if patients have questions, they're going to ask, right? They might not know what questions to ask. And this is, this is your Tuesday. It is a completely new experience with them. They might not know who to ask. Do they ask the doctor questions, the nurse questions? Maybe they really should have engaged with the respiratory therapist more. Or this is all coming at them too fast. It's too much. They're just too overwhelmed. Like things need to sit with them a little bit. But by the time they calm down a little, maybe, maybe you're not around. There's also the idea that somebody who's very articulate, somebody who has overall high literacy, that, that means they have high health literacy. And for that, just keep in mind that every discipline has its jargon and stressful situations inhibit understanding. If I were to go across campus and talk to somebody who's an engineering major, I'd be out of my depth pretty quickly. And nobody would expect me to understand engineering. That's completely outside my wheelhouse. But that student can understand. And so likewise, why would we accept, expect somebody who is maybe a businessman to understand healthcare? That's, that's not what they do all day. That's not their expertise. And as I was saying, stressful situations inhibit understanding. Also keep in mind that jargon isn't necessarily those three syllable words or the, the anatomical and physiological terms. It can also just be things in different contexts. Um, inflammation, for example, what inflammation means 
to a healthcare worker might mean something different to a patient. So making sure that everybody's on the same page, even as far as definitions of words that may be part of more everyday life. So let's talk about my chart for a minute. So my chart is a great tool. Um, it really helps with education between families and providers. You have all your info right there. You can update contact information. You can message the doctor. You can double check lab results to maybe show somebody who's outside of network. And so it can be really helpful, except when it's not. So when you have these results, that doesn't necessarily mean the doctor has gone over them with you. So this is not a stock photo. Um, this is actually an x-ray of my daughter from three years ago. Um, she broke her arm pretty badly. And via my chart, I got this um, text from the radiologist before the doctor came out and spoke to me. And this, this is what it said, moderately dorsally angulated supracondyl fracture of the distal right humerus. I understand what those words mean because I have been a medical librarian for the better part of a decade. I have a bachelor's in nursing. And since I was about five years old, my mom has been an x-ray tech. But when I'm reading those with my daughter in the ER, all that knowledge goes out the window. Like mostly I am just seeing that badly broken bone and my seven-year-old in pain. So keeping that kind of thing in mind, like, okay, yes, I could message the doctor after getting that, but just providing patients with results without making sure they understand the results that's not good practice. But speaking of good practice, just some things to keep in mind for healthcare workers overall is don't assume understanding or that somebody else has already discussed the matter with your patient. Communicate to all patients as if their health literacy is low. There are a variety of tools, rubrics, what have you, for assessing health literacy. And the purpose of those is more for pre-test and post-test. Um, you're determining literacy level after an intervention. Those are not meant for everyday use. Just assume that the patient doesn't know what you're talking about and go from there. If it turns out, I feel like, you know what, can you not explain things quite so minutely? I, you know, like, I do actually know about this topic. Like, you know, that's great, but start as if they don't. And empower them to ask questions. Patients need to be involved in their care. It is not a one-way conversation. Everybody benefits from clear communication and being on the same page. And this can be really difficult. Um, this is where compassion and patience really comes into play. Explaining something simply without being condescending is difficult. This person's in the hospital, they're in the clinic, they might be very sick. On top of that, they don't wanna have people think they're an idiot. So don't speak to them as if they're completely ignorant. Everybody has their area of expertise. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, they're an expert in something you're not. You're an expert in something they're not. We're all people, so try to keep that in mind. I tell my nursing students, um, approach it as if you're communicating with a respected elder. Because you, you still want to be respectful and, and treat them with kindness, but you also want to make sure that you're engaging with them. Okay, this is all great. Like you've learned about health literacy, you're empowered to do it. Like you really want to put these to the test, but you do have some obstacles. 
it's highly likely that you're understaffed and you may not have the nurse educators. Um, you may not have the, the time to go over this with patients. During shift report, information falls through the cracks. There's no way everything can be conveyed during shift report. It's meant to be concise. Knowledge of resources, maybe you know that patients need to get more education on something, but you just don't have the background and the confidence to know where to look for that. Um, primary care and same-day surgery, workers are only with those patients for a small amount of time, and that amount of time might not be enough to convey what needs to be, what needs to be said. And especially if this isn't something that was learned in school, um, people might not be comfortable with patient teaching. You can absolutely like get arterial blood gases. You can like, you can do surgery, but like oh bedside manner that's that's that part I'm not sure about. But like everything else, it just comes with practice. So what do you do? Um, first of all, you have access to patient education materials. So point of care tools like Dynamed and Up to Date do have patient education handouts. Um, there's actually some on PubMed as well. Um, if you're at UIH, um, HealthWise is the patient education portal within Epic that has a lot of stuff. Um, it also has some information that's um, written by specific doctors for their clinics. There's also Lippincott Advisor has some patient education materials. But mostly just talk to patients. Like instead of saying, do you have any questions? It's what questions do you have? And this works really well in lectures too, because do you have any questions is more like, okay, well, I'm done, but we can keep going if you want to. What questions do you have is more encouraging. Um, it, it, people are going to get more involved. And ensure patients understand. Use the teach back method. Um, chunk and check is just like, okay, like do little bits at a time. Check for understanding. Um, the last thing you want to do is say, do you understand? And people feel stupid if they say no. So I'm saying like, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. And, and hope that they did. So there are some resources you can use beyond what um, the university has, beyond what the hospital has. The CDC is a great resource. Um, they have an entire section on health literacy. Um, these three below here um, are actually professional development um, courses you can take for CEs. AHRQ has a section on health literacy. Um, there's improvement tools, professional education. And don't forget about the library. I, we are happy to help you find resources for patients, um, find resources on how to better communicate with patients, um, what other ways to teach students. We have a librarian for every health science college. Um, there's a whole team of us for nursing. We also have librarians for medicine, dentistry, allied health, and, and pharmacy. We can help you find information. We can also help patients and families. Um, we are open to the public. Um, during the day, if somebody wants to come in, use one of our public computers, we can absolutely help them find information. So um, keep that kind of stuff in mind. And also keep in mind that education doesn't stop at discharge. Like let's say somebody goes in for same day surgery of a wrist. Like that bandage is going to be on when they leave the hospital, but like once they get home and they take it off, they might forget everything you said about changing the bandage or what to look for. And you don't want them to just Google because especially somebody with lower health literacy, it's difficult to tell the good from the bad on the internet. So the public library has reference books, has a whole nonfiction section, and a lot of them also have some databases, um, not necessarily the same ones you have access to at a university or hospital, but they do have some databases. And they are trained to find information. 
National Library of Medicine has a great website called Medline Plus, and it's written for patients. So that means it's mostly at a fourth grade level, which is what patient education is supposed to be at. And it contains patient education in other languages. The more common the language, um, the more information it's going to have. But over 30 languages have basic things like vaccine information, um, like flu vaccine, that kind of thing. Common diseases and conditions have associations that have a lot of information for, for patients and also support groups. There's national support groups. Um, there may even be county level. There's usually state level. So a look at some of these sources. And these are just screenshots. Um, like I said, Medline Plus, you can see up here, it's through National Library of Medicine. It's searchable. Um, you can put stuff in there like, like elbow fracture. And, the, and you could look up okay, like what are some signs and symptoms? What, what's the doctor going to do? What can you expect? Or you could put in peanut allergy. Like I can't imagine how terrifying it would be to have a young child with a severe allergy because like, don't, well, don't freak out the parents. They're, you're going to, to a certain extent, but you need to give them resources. And also we have health topics, drugs and supplements is really useful. It has um, interactions, minor side effects, major side effects, like I said, for supplements as well as drugs. Uh, medical tests, more about that. Health recipes, it's a lot of really good information here. And it's all vetted information. That there's foundations for common conditions, cystic fibrosis, uh, burn survivors, a lot of support needed there. Um, NAMI, hope I'm saying that right, National Alliance on Mental Illness has an Illinois chapter, whole website on meetings and support groups. The point being, if you know where to look, there's all this support, all this information, but for somebody who is new to a diagnosis, they don't know these things. And, and you are in a position to help them so that they can be better informed, so they can be more involved in their care and have better prognosis. So that is it for my presentation. Um, as this is recorded, I cannot take any questions, but this is my contact info. If you you email me, I am happy to answer questions. I'm at the Health Sciences Library on the first floor. I'd be happy to meet with people, have a conversation about this. This is something I, I care a lot about. So really, if anybody has any questions or wishes to discuss things further, um, please contact me. And here are my references. I thank you for your attention. And I hope you all have a wonderful day.